Benvenuti a un altro appuntamento di SciArt Switzerland, questo progetto che la Fondazione Ipsa per la ricerca scientifica sta portando eh, avanti in partnership con eh, il MASI, il Museo d'Arte della Svizzera Italiana e con il, con il LAC. Eh, si alternano eventi, incontri, conversazioni che hanno come focus quello di approfondire, di analizzare, esplorare eh, le connessioni, mh, tutto ciò che eh, l'arte e, e la scienza possono avere in comune o non in comune. Eh, abbiamo eh, fatto un percorso ormai eh, abbastanza lungo in questi anni insieme al Masi, eh, il progetto prima ah, si chiamava la scienza regola d'arte, se qualcuno eh, di voi ha frequentato alcuni dei nostri eventi eh, ed era appunto un ciclo di conversazioni tra artisti e scienziati. All'interno di, eh, di questi dialoghi eh, abbiamo sempre mh, scoperto eh, temi interessanti che ci hanno fatto indotti a, eh, ad approfondire ancora di più questo, questo progetto con questa nuova modalità che è quella appunto di invitare un artista che eh, già eh, coinvolto e già impegnato in, questa, in questo ambito eh, di arte e scienza. Stasera abbiamo eh, due illustri ospiti, eh, però prima di questo io chiamo il direttore eh, del, del Masi eh, a farci un saluto e a introdurli. Buona serata, vi ricordo che al termine, intanto potete sicuramente fare delle domande ai nostri ospiti e poi abbiamo un aperitivo per tutti nel chiostro uscendo a sinistra, comunque ve lo ricorderò alla fine. Direttore. Buonasera, grazie Silva, un grande piacere per il Masi che vi dà il benvenuto, di, uh, darvi il benvenuto per un'altra puntata con questa bellissima collaborazione che stiamo avendo con la Fondazione Ipsa ormai da parecchi anni. Um, I'm going to switch to English now because I'm going to introduce uh, our guests. Um, as you uh, have seen, the conversation tonight was also going to be held in English. I think there's a translation also available for those of you who should like to have one. Uh, so, uh, first uh, I'll introduce Giovanni Carmine, uh, who does not really need an introduction. I think he's been here before. He's one of our most cherished uh, guests uh, for uh, this type of events. Uh, he has a long experience in doing uh, such talks brilliantly and uh, he's, as you know, also director of the Kunsthalle in St. Gallen. He's been the curator of the Swiss pavilion of the Venice Biennial. He's also the curator, the responsible curator for Art Unlimited, the big exhibition that every year you can see uh, in parallel to Art Basel. So, benvenuto, welcome, Giovanni. <laughs> Giovanni is going to also introduce a little bit our other guest, Uriel Orlov, so I will say only very little. Uriel uh, was born in Switzerland and grew up in Zurich, then uh, moved to London where he was based for many years and is currently living and active as an artist in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, I think when we talk about art and science, as just to put it in the most general way, I think he's one of the most uh, apt uh, guests we can have because his work, his production, his practice is a type of artistic practice which basically is research from the very start. So in any project that he ventured into from the very beginning, whatever the theme may be, whatever the artistic means of expression may be at the beginning, at the core, at the center, there's always a research into the theme. It may be a social research, so social science is of course also a matter and a theme here, but it may also be the hard sciences that do interest him and the way how they can bridge and build bridges into a 
the world of art and how art can possibly also go beyond what uh, these scientific methodologies can provide us with. Uh, I should like to thank all our colleagues, uh, particularly who helped to organize this evening from the Department of Communication, Laura Pomari, Martina Santurri and Silvia Zanni. Thank you very much for your marvelous help. And I should like to thank uh, Francesca Benini, Francesca Benini, uh, who conceived that evening, who curated uh, in a certain way that event. So, grazie mille, uh, Francesca. And I immediately pass on the mic to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh. Buonasera. Funziona il microfono? Mi sentite? Buonasera. Uh, I also like, um, I, I'm going to switch immediately in English, even though my Italian is much better than my English. <laughs> um, let's try. So I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I would like also to thank the Masi, Francesca, and the uh, Ipsa Foundation for the nice invitation. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to share the stage with uh, Uriel Orlov. He's not only one of the, I dare to say, one of the most important living Swiss artists, but he's also a, a very good friend. And uh, we never s spoke publicly together, and uh, it's an occasion to, uh, to deepen his, his work uh, with you tonight. His biography, it's immense. I think he participated to nearly all the biennial possible around the world. He's a nomad himself. He, he, uh, um, I think through, through the, the slides you will see, you, you, uh, for the one of you that doesn't know the work, uh, will get to know uh, deeper what are his interests. Um, Maybe the, the main media is using his video, but not only. Uh, I think uh, building communities is also one of his uh, media he's using, and sharing knowledge is also one of the, the media he's using. And um, just a little, another biographical uh, detail. He was born in Zurich, he studied in London, and he moved to Lisbon a couple of years ago. And this year, he received the, the uh, Primere Toppenheim from the Swiss Federal Office of Culture, which is like the highest um, award that an artist can receive in Switzerland. And maybe Ticino cheering <laughs> Uriel for the uh, Primere Toppenheim. Since Merit was closed from Lugano, uh, I think it's, it's due to also in Ticino. <laughs> so, um, we would like to, to start actually in medias res, and uh, I please you to start the... I will. I join my thanks. I will not repeat them. Thank you very much. Let's go. Umnuli Hana Umkulu Se futafu, Ludwong, Mpasang Hala, Isi Dwadwa, Utupu, Isi Fiti, Mabele, Tanduti, Mamile, Mungraso, Mohodiri, Nos, Kamaku, Moseche, Motwanye, Motiba de Fat, Makatala, Koza, Mukote di omuholo mukono. So what what we um, heard here? Uh, oh, sorry, I lost my. Um, it's a sound excerpt of what plants were called before they had a name. Uh, it's a work we showed in an exhibition uh, we did together in St. Gallen in two thousand. Uh, 18, and um, uh, 
uh, the show was called, called uh, Theater Botanicum, and the, the core topic of the exhibition um, was were plants, maybe, I can say it like that. And uh, um, I think many, many important topics of your work come together in this piece here. Um, as I say before, the idea of sharing knowledge, uh, un or relearning, and uh, also the fact that you have a, a practice which is very rooted into local places. Wherever you go, you do specific works uh, connected to the, the, the context. And, um, and also the idea of post-colonial, which is very uh, important in your work. Do you want to explain us what we heard here? So what plants were called before they had a name um, started with a visit to South Africa that was just a research visit. Um, and I went also to a lot of archives. I was invited to visit several archives. And I had a sort of accidental meeting in the cafe of the National Botanical Garden, Kirstenbosch in Cape Town. And what struck me when I was walking through this botanical garden, which is one of the first botanical gardens that focuses on indigenous plants, local plants, where most botanical gardens are museums, maybe colonial museums of plants that were brought from all over the world. Um, this specific botanical garden focused on local plants from Southern Africa. And I noticed the labels and all the labels were written in Latin, the Latin name of the plant, and in English, or Afrikaans sometimes. And I was wondering, it really struck me, what it means in a country that has 11 official languages. We are over 25 years after the end of apartheid, and we just have English and Latin, which is one national language, and Latin isn't a national language. Um, so it immediately sort of uh, returns us to the beginnings of the European project in South Africa, as it were, the colonial project, um, which was accompanied, it was not just an economic project, the Dutch East India Company, uh, looking essentially for a place to replenish the ships, um, and grow vegetables, so the colonial project started with a garden, but it was also a scientific project. And so these early moments of colonialism was accompanied by scientific expeditions where we had botanists and other scientists explore this new country and find new plants, which were new to them, the European botanists or scientists, but were of course already known to the local population and were renamed in this process with Latin names, entering them into the Linnaean system of classification, which is a specific system that a scientist from Sweden, Carl Linnaeus, uh, created to organize all living uh, uh, beings in, um, from plants to animals. Um, uh, with families and species, um, so a double name, a binomial. Um, so the, the plants are entered into this European system, uh, in, in a sense coerced into it, and the local knowledge is obliterated. And this uh, sort of epistemic violence, this violence of knowledge, is something that continues today. We still use these Latin names. They are very useful, in fact, to communicate across languages, but an obliteration continues. So what I wanted to do was to think about this knowledge that existed already and that still exists in people's uh, language in their everyday. So I traveled through, uh, through South Africa over a number of years and recorded plant names in 12 or 13 local languages. And so what we hear is these plant names a kind of audio dictionary of plant names, what plants were called before they had a name. Um, uh, sorry. Um, so it's displayed um, as an audio installation, which is, um, it, it can be just a room with sound, and we're in a sort of sound garden, or sometimes it's displayed 
as a library or in conjunction with a library to also make us think about this relationship between oral knowledge and written knowledge and how knowledge is transmitted. So what, what is the consequence of it? What, how the public react to such a gesture of uh, reappropriating or re-teaching or re-unlearning and relearning to people? How the public react to that? Um, I think one of the first experiences that we all shared here is that we are excluded from that knowledge. We don't master it, but it exists and we witness it. And for me, this is an important moment to acknowledge that there are knowledges that we might not have access to, but they still exist. Um, and we witness them. Um, so it's a kind of, it's almost a sort of, um, yeah, it's not exactly it's not exactly what science might do. And people ask sometimes, why don't you show the images of the plants? Then we could like put the word, the name, to the image. But it's precisely not necessarily about learning, but about acknowledging also a certain ignorance, and that is always part of any project around knowledge. And in your research, in the, in the way you developed a project, how do you master the balance between, let's say, the scientific knowledge and the popular uh, knowledge? It's always a tension. Um, and I think, um, I mean, we will see it more in other projects where there is a dialogue between those two languages, scientific knowledge and local knowledge. Um, it's all, yeah, I think it's always kind of acknowledging these two systems have their validity, but they're also in conflict sometimes, and there are power relations involved. So in terms of the colonial history, the local knowledge, because it was not written down, it was oral, it was easy to be dismissed. So there is always a primacy of the written, a primacy of the written word that can be uh, sort of published and disseminated. And what is oral is ephemeral and can easily be put to one side. And sometimes, perhaps as an artist, my role, I feel, is to also look and listen for things that are not necessarily visible or audible mm -hmm. so, so straight away. What I tend to call the work uh, with you, it's most of the time a constellation of pieces. It's not like an artwork as we, or the, the wide public thinks about a painting uh, or an object, something finished, but uh, your work or your works are more like constellations of uh, projects. And uh, uh, maybe we can go to, to the next, um, the next iteration, actually, of uh, what plants were called before um, they had a name. Do you want to tell us about the last yes. uh, iteration? Yes, so a few project? years after being in South Africa, I was invited to develop a project in Guatemala for the biennial of Guatemala, and I visited a local market and I found a publication um, from the 1970s from the Indigenous Institute at the University of Guatemala. And uh, you can see it at the top, Guatemala Indigena, and it was showing plants that had medicinal properties that were used in Mayan medicine. And it would show a picture of the plant and what it's used for and a Spanish translation. So I thought, or, or a name in Spanish. So immediately this triggered a similar reaction to me. Here we have a publication of um, uh, plants with medicinal properties and we only have a Spanish name. So we again have a kind of obliteration of a certain form of knowledge, but we also have an extraction of knowledge at the same time. So I took this publication with me and I traveled through Guatemala and I showed it to Mayan healers, uh, spiritual guides, medicinal, medicinal guides, and I, I would ask them um, which plants were known to them and what the plants were called in their local language, in, their, um, in the local Mayan language. So over time, the publication grew 
Um, it had new layers of knowledge added to it. Um, so we have several new names. Um, and I then presented this as an installation where the pages of the book are shown on overhead projectors, which are a sort of instrument that we remember from university uh, from a long time ago, before video projectors existed. So I used the technology that was also from that time, from the 70s, to display these pages um, like an educational technology, as it were, and we see also the process of the Mayan healers engaging um, with it. So I, I suppose it's, yeah, it's an example for things never being finished. We are engaged, I'm engaging with something, but uh, the methods might change, the questions might change, but um, yeah, there is a conversation over time between works also. Do you have the feeling this is something that you share with scientists as an artist, like this, this kind of trial and error and, and like experimenting with, with things over the time also? Is it something? Yes, yes I think so. I think, I mean, um, yeah, it's also kind of you try to go further, you look at a different aspect. I think in science you might have certain lab experiments, you have certain things you're looking for, you have results, but then you're not finished. You, you will still go back and look for more or for different things that you missed the first time. And I think as artists also, we don't, even though maybe I operate in different local contexts, but I take my questions with me, I take my methodologies with me, and I need to go back. I need to find out more. Yeah, I mean, this, this work, uh, I think it's peculiar because it brings together uh, many of the topics which are totally uh, rooted in, in the contemporary world, but also in your, in your work, like biodiversity, um, and social and cultural and linguistic uh, diversity. Uh, but there is also the topic of healing, which is, uh, I think, also an important topic, at least in the, in the contemporary art world at the moment, um, in the Migro Museum in Zurich, which is one of the uh, best institutions for contemporary art at the moment. There is an exhibition about healing. Um, how do you connect your work with the topic of healing also in this kind of complicated mm. world we live in at the moment? I mean, our conversation is called Learning from Plants, and I have seen myself as a student of plants for, for quite a while. I've started to become interested, I've not always been interested in plants, but for the last few years I've been thinking about plants as ways to think about uh, history and politics and other things. Um, and when it comes to healing, I suppose um, we have a lot to learn from plants because plants are the first um, the first healers, the first substances that uh, we've uh, used as humans. Um, so what is our relationship to healing through plants? How do plants do medicine? How do plants defend themselves against parasites and illnesses? And we've been learning from that. Science, medical science has been learning from that and has been looking quite closely. What are the ingredients? How do plants do things? So. I'm kind of trying to take this quite seriously, not just to use things from plants, but to learn um, from plants. Um, Maybe the next slide is a good example for that. So I was for a while in London, I was interested in this kind of local knowledge of plants and healing. And we did a number of workshops in in a specific neighborhood that was very diverse, that had a migratory background. And there were people there from Bangladesh, from Sudan, from Italy, from, from all over. Um, and we ran a number of workshops uh, to talk to people around the knowledge that they have that has been transmitted through, through families, through grandparents, for using certain things in certain situations, headaches, stomachache, things like this. And 
it was just a kind of conversation, but it became so big that we ended up with quite a big list of plants and their uses. And then we decided to make um, a, a medicinal plant garden, a communal herbal knowledge garden, um, which we can see here. Um, we were thinking again about how knowledge is usually transmitted and the question of the plant names. And here we had lots of different languages and cultures. So we did make labels, but the labels were slightly different. They had the use of the plants at the center and then various names in different languages around, um, as you can see here. Um, we also, um, we also organized workshops, um, how the plants are used, how to make tinctures, how to make creams. Um, and we ended up making a little publication, again, thinking about how this knowledge is usually transmitted and how we want it to engage with it. So it was actually organized according to parts of the body, not alphabetically. Um, and it was very much centered around this knowledge, uh, 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 around the idea of communal knowledge, of not knowledge that um, is like somewhere uh, maybe patented or owned, but it's actually sort of shared in the community. Um, so these are the four different publications um, so from this. Is it, this is a project from 2016, so a while ago. And uh, I would like to know, is, is this garden still active? Do you, uh, or is this community that you created still active? Uh, yes, it is. The garden still exists. The local community kind of has ownership of it. And I get invited from time to time, like once a year to an event that they organize there. And for me, this is really important and really beautiful that it's a project that I initiated and the community was created through this project, but it actually continues beyond me and it's not dependent on me. Um, and it was accompanying an exhibition also of Teatrum Botanicum in London. And it was sort of, it, it, it really emerged out of thinking uh, the work that I did in South Africa, which also was looking at medicinal plants, and we might look at it in a second, um, trying to create a dialogue with local knowledge so that it's not just, oh, this happens over there, but we don't actually have this knowledge anymore, but we do. And so it created a dialogue. Yeah, it seems the perfect uh, moment to, to talk about uh, learning from Artemisia, <laughs> which is uh, a project commissioned by the Lubumbashi Biennial in Congo in 2019, or a project that you developed in, in the context of the Lubumbashi Biennial. And, um, well, Artemisia Afra is the protagonist of this project, uh, uh, which is an indigenous uh, medicinal plant, uh, which has a superpower, which is <laughs> uh, to fight malaria. And yes. you want to tell us a little bit about this project? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a very interesting plant, Artemisia afra, um, because as you say, it, um, it can uh, serve as a... Uh, a plant that can heal malaria or treat malaria, but it can also prevent malaria. And should I use? <laughs> Do you want to use this? I use this. Um, and it's interesting because it has a kind of it has quite a complex relationship with science. Um, the story begins, I don't know, two thousand years ago, probably. The Chinese used a sister plant, Artemisia annua, for a long time against fevers. And during the Vietnam War, the Chinese would furnish this plant to the Viet Cong. And the Viet Cong had much less cases of malaria and the Americans had more malaria. So after the Vietnam War, there was a lot of interest in this plant. And um, it was found that it has a so-called active ingredient, which is called artemisinin, and the Nobel Prize was given for this discovery of artemisinin, which we see here, which is, um, which is a molecule. 
um, um, and which is considered the active ingredient of the Chinese variety. And this was used then in new medications against malaria that um, previous medications were also um, from plants, from the Kinchona tree that was found in Peru, that was then brought to India during the colonial project and cultivated in the root of that tree. Um, um, was also found to have properties that were, were helping against malaria. But what happens is that over time, when we use a single active ingredient, the parasite, the illness gets clever through mutations and it becomes resistant to this ingredient. So what they did was they combined artemisinin with two other ingredients and created a new, a new medication. At the same time, um, I'll just go back to Artemisia afra. At the same time, there is a local variety of this plant in Africa, which grows in much of sub-Saharan Africa, that has the same properties. Um, and people can grow it, and it works. Um, but there is a kind of tension between, um, say, the World Health Organization that manages projects um, and wants to to have uh, uh, use uh, substances which are very much controlled. You know exactly how much you're getting. When you use a plant and you make a tea from it, you don't know necessarily how many grams you get. So there's a different relationship. And it is not known why this plant is working because it doesn't have this uh, active ingredient, artemisinin, and yet it still works. So it kind of eludes science. And when I was in Lubumbashi, I found out about this tea. Somebody I met actually just had malaria and told me they were using this as a tea. And I got really interested precisely because it at the moment still resists knowledge. And it also resists the resistance of the parasite because it's not just one ingredient, it's a whole cocktail. And it comes from a place, the Congo, which is one of the most mined places in the world because it has a lot of minerals. And these minerals also enter the plant. Um, so I looked into this and I found out that a women's collective south of Lubumbashi are growing it and selling it in the city, but people don't know much about it. So we decided to make a garden together with the women's collective, um, uh, which you can see here for the Biennale. So this was a second garden project, I suppose. Um, we needed also like a manual, how the plant is used. So we made a mural which shows the instructions, essentially, how long you leave the plant in the water, how much you drink, um, which we see here. And then it became, it became a different work that traveled outside of Congo, um, which was a video. Also, we could taste the tea in the installation, learning from Artemisia. It also talks about this history of malaria and its various treatments and how they are derived from plant materials and, and the question of resistance and extraction. Um, and I also collaborated with the husbands of the women from this collective um, and we made a song that was a sort of like, I suppose, like health education song. They had already made an Ebola song and an HIV song. So we made an Artemisia song and I'll just play a minute of it. J'aime les étoiles des as qui vous chantent un très bon produit qui traite actuellement en Afrique, en Europe, en Amérique, la malaria chronique. C'est l'Artemisia Afra et l'Artemisia Anoa qui viennent du Vietnam et de la Chine. C'est une grande histoire et c'est Orient, vous pourrez vous parler encore. Mais c'est l'Orchestre des Jeunes Étoiles d'Artemisia qui vous chante maintenant la chanson, la meilleure chanson d'Artemisia Afra. Namolelie, 
I don't know the mic. Yeah, the, the mic works again. And in this installation, maybe can you go back just quickly to mm -hmm. the installation? And uh, I read there is a letter which is part of the installation, a letter that you wrote to the people. Um, what is written in this letter? <laughs> so the letter is this. It's kind of it's actually a letter that I'm writing from Lubumbashi to here. Um, I was thinking a lot about working in that context and what we did and how to show this and how to contextualize it. And it seemed to me that it's, it's a kind of letter that I'm sending. So um, it was translated into, yeah, it was translated into a letter where I'm reflecting, starting with a reflection about the computer that I'm using to write this letter, which has minerals that come from the Congo. Um, moving to the history of malaria in the Congo, um, the way the city was organized even, it had two separate areas for the local population and the Belgian population, and there was a so-called sanitary cordon in the middle, which was as wide as was thought to be the maximum flight distance of the malaria mosquito. So the Belgians thought they could avoid malaria by having 500 meters separation between the two parts of the city. So it sort of moves through architecture and then returns to plants and treatments and then um, moves, uh, moves actually south of Lubumbashi to the women's collective and the work that they do and how that sits in a kind of global context. So it reflects also your position yes. as an artist extracting yes. actually the knowledge yes. of the local population as yes. companies extract yes. minerals from the soil. Yeah, it raises this question. It raises this question, what is my role as an artist making images there and traveling with these images? Is this also a form of extraction? And so for this work actually, uh, we decided to develop a kind of circular economy model from the beginning. So whenever this work is shown and I get an artist fee, the collective also gets a fee. So we always share the proceeds um, from the distribution of this work because what uh, would happen easily is that, that maybe I pay people who I work with, but then I travel with the work and I get cultural capital out of it and get paid perhaps for showing the work but nothing goes back. So we wanted to think about these relationships that we build and obviously the privilege that I have traveling there with funding from European bodies and returning here and having a work in my, in, um, uh, through this process and what that means for them and what, what a local community can get out of that um, moving forward. Yes. So the medicinal plants um, are recurrent in, in your work. Maybe we can go to Muti, an image of the... Actually, this is an image of the show we had in Sangalen. And uh, um, these are Muti that were prepared in South Africa. And uh, do you want to tell us what, what exactly are these, these things and what they're used for and uh, how did you learned about, uh, how do you learn about these things? Well, I mean, the word muti, so the title of this word is muti, M-U-T-H-I. The word muti means tree in Zulu, but it also refers to all medicinal matter. Um, and what interested me was the presence, the very strong presence of medicinal plants in South Africa about 60% of the population use traditional medicine and use, use traditional plants. Um, and I started to get intrigued with the presentation of these plants in the markets, how they are sold, and how the plants become actors in this whole medical system. So I wanted to show them. Again, we don't actually have the information what each plant is used for, because it's not necessarily about that. 
It's again about witnessing these plants and the context from which they come, because um, we have other works around it that speak to this context. Um, I can maybe just say the very first one is um, Mpepo. It's a, it's a kind of African sage variety. And sage in many cultures also have spiritual properties where you can, um, you can use them as incense to sort of clean a house, to clean the sort of spiritual context of a place. And I was interested in this kind of perhaps slippery slope between um, like practical uses and spiritual uses and, and the way historically these things were not necessarily separated. Yeah. So time is running, so we need to um, advance. Maybe, maybe do you want to show the, the video clip of uh, Mbizo? Yeah, we could show a clip of this. So I started thinking much more around the relationship between various knowledge systems, a modern medical knowledge system and traditional knowledge systems. I came across a court case from 1940 where a traditional healer was accused for using European plants in his preparations, which we filmed. And as I was making that, so he was accused of stealing from the West, as it were. And as I was filming this, we won't have time to show it. Um, it's called the crown against Mafavuge. He was called Mafavuge and the crown was the British crown. And I found the entire transcript of this court case from 1940 and we restaged it. And as I was filming this, I realized that actually this is sort of one side of a coin and a story that continues today where the tables perhaps are turned and there is a lot of Western research in the global south for traditional medicine, for ingredients, for plants that are then developed into, into medications or into, into products like shampoo, for example, and other things. Um, which uh, we hear about, um, which are not necessarily using this circular economy model. And so there are questions with, um, with whose knowledge it is and how knowledge is shared. So I wanted uh, Mafavuke, the accused from 1940, to return to the present and have a conversation about this. And so uh, this is a tribunal, Imbizo Kamafavuke means Mafavuge's tribunal, and we can just see maybe um, again a minute and a half of it. judge. <laughs> The Ko, who are the original users of robots, make no money from this industry. They live in extreme poverty. And even the gatherers, the people who actually go out into the wild and find this robots, make no money out of it. We're setting up regional documentation centers through which we are hoping to to gather all local available indigenous knowledge and to capture it in a central database. That way anybody looking to uh, do research or product development on a plant will have to go through us, the government, uh, to get uh, consent from the original knowledge holders and also to uh, negotiate a benefit sharing agreement. Mm. If we give our knowledge without consulting with the ancestors or our fellow healers, our ancestors will be angered. Mm -hmm. And that will jeopardize the sacredness of our knowledge. A lot of what used to be common land is now privately owned. We do no longer have access to natural resources. Okay, but this is exactly why we need laws to conserve biodiversity. Yeah, man, kijkie. Conservation has always been a way to control the indigenous population. Preservation becomes oppression.
think uh, by by this moment it's clear for everybody here that you're very interested into uh, post-colonial um, topics uh, and uh, the history of colonialism. Uh, maybe we, we want to talk just quickly about Reading Wood, which I think it's an interesting project connected to uh, the idea of colonialism and also to extraction and uh, misuse of, uh, of power on one side and also um, and also um, development of, of a sort of knowledge which is uh, not scientific but is based on experience. Do you want to tell us about this project? So reading wood backwards um, has as its starting point a wood library in Lisbon, where I live now, um, which has been, has been collected, has been amassed over a century. It was started in 1900. Um, and its focus was the Portuguese colonial world and the wood from, from the colonies, from Zimbabwe, uh, 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 from, uh, uh, from Angola, from Mozambique, from, from various places um, that had rainforests, that had particular trees, wood that was not available in Europe. And so it was a kind of, um, it was part of the Colonial Research Institute at the university um, or the Tropical Research Institute and it was focusing on wood and it was looking for example at what various parts of the tree um, uh, 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 would be uh, usable and what they can be used for and what products can be developed from it. Um, and I think it's interesting for me because it's a sort of wood is the primary moment of our rela extractive relationship to nature. Um, we have Aristotle to thank for this. Actually, Aristotle came up with a lot of abstract concepts that we now use. One of the concepts is matter. Um, we didn't necessarily have a concept before for matter because it's abstract. It's not stone or wood or something else, it's matter. And the word that he used for matter, the Greek word is highly, which is timber, which is wood. So he basically used a word for matter that is wood that can be shaped into anything, that can be used for everything. So it's no longer seen as a tree, as a living being, but as a resource for us to shape into something else furniture, buildings, ships. Um, so I was looking into this relationship between knowledge, extraction, naming, uh, preserving, but also the kinds of images that are produced. So this is a macroscopic image of a tree from this collection, um, which I found in uh, the research archive, but I didn't find an image of the tree it was from. The tree was forgotten. It was just a sample of wood and this microscopic image. So I was thinking a lot around what is going on nowadays in terms of discourse of museum collections and um, um, especially ethnographic museums that have a kind of complex history of acquisition where questions of restitutions are being raised and talked about. Now, what would restitution mean in terms of a collection like this? Who do we return it to? The wood is not just taken from a different culture, but it's also taken from nature, as it were. And what would restitution to nature look like? So the work is a sort of rehearsal for restitution. So it's an installation that uses uh, woods from the different places that were found also in, in the library. And it has a second part outside of the exhibition space, which are these images of the tree and a performance that actually sort of uses the elements from the installation, dismantles it, deconstructs it, and returns it to the tree, as it were, as a symbolic gesture, of course, to make us think about this question of restitution. Yes, since... Um uh, we are at the end of our conversation. 
Uh, sort we sort of, of we, we, we skip the next project and we go to, to, to the last uh, topic that I wanted to talk with you, uh, which is, I think, um, I mean, probably the most urgent topic we have at the moment, and uh, uh, which is uh, the climate emergency. Or some call it crisis, some call it emergency. I prefer to call it emergency. Um, and this is a project also that shows your, your uh, transnational approach, um, because the, the, the version uh, or the, pro the, the image that we see here, um, it's of the, the iteration of up, up, up that you uh, made in, um, uh, in the Himalayan. And then you, you did also a version in the Swiss Alps. So do you, do you want to tell us what, what do we see here? What do we see here? Um, we see um, 150 years of climate change uh, translated into colors. So each of the years, so it's, uh, it's, it's the climate, the temperature in the Himalayas. Each year, the average temperature is translated into a color. It's a, it, it's a system that was evolved at Reading University in the UK by Ed Hawkins, a climate scientist who looked for a way to translate the data that is collected into a kind of chromatic system. And for me, it was interesting to use this chromatic system to find new ways of representing and thinking about climate change. So we have here a 35 meter long corridor and we can walk from uh, the beginning of the 20th century to 2022. And we can see that slowly the colors change and at the end we see there it's uh, the reds and browns. Um, so this is the context of the project. The project itself is thinking about what happens at high altitude, far away from the cameras, not the fires and the floods that usually represent climate change, but perhaps something much more quiet, a change that is going on that we don't see because it's over 3,000 meters high. And this change is plants moving upwards because it gets warmer, there is new habitats are available to them, so slowly they migrate um, um, in altitude. Yeah, in altitude, in higher altitudes. So what we see here is kind of field notebooks from researchers in India who made research around specific plants. I mean, they kind of recreated field field notebooks um, around specific plants at specific locations that were found at much higher altitude and how this was tracked. Um, and it's a conversation, as I said, we can already run the video, that uh, for me is important to have translocally. Climate change is something that affects the whole globe in different ways. It's also not caused um, um, perhaps equally, um, but it's something we need to think about globally and translocally. And it's the same phenomenon that we have in the Swiss Alps. So I worked uh, with Sonja Wipf, the head scientist at the Swiss National Park in the Engadine, um, who has been conducting a summit flora research project, um, which looks precisely at various summits in the Swiss Alps and looks at historical data of what plants were found at different altitudes uh, or, uh, uh, and also through various times and where these plants are now. So we went on an expedition to, to uh, the Gorehorn, one mountain that has data that goes back to the 19th century. And for example, through this expedition, for the first time we saw blueberries at this altitude. Blueberries had never been found at 3000 meters high. So it was the first time um, we encountered that. So the video shows that. I also made a series of drawings um, which reflect the plants on Pitts Leonard, one specific mountain that had one plant in 1835 and now has 17 plants. And we see the plants sort of in motion. Um, we see here Pitts Leonard and the different expeditions over time between 1835 and 2021 in a silk screen that sort of shows the way that 
the mountain is moving almost through climate change. And um, I also collected the data from climate change in Switzerland from 1835 to um, 2021 and translated it. Yeah, I think we started with an artwork. We want to end with an artwork. I think uh, what artists does is that they manage to make complexity visible and, uh, and somehow to, to connect the complex knowledge um, to a wide public. So I um, would like to finish uh, showing you one un uh, 185 years. Uh, it's just one and a half minute clip, but I think it's interesting to see what's going on in Switzerland at the moment. It's 185 seconds long. <laughs> I cheated. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, I... No, it's going. Okay.
so well. Thank you very much, Uriel, for sharing with us uh, your practice. I think we have uh, five minutes for questions. And then we can go to the Chiostro degli Angeli and uh, uh, continue our talk. If there are any impellent questions from the public, um, there is a microphone here. Oh, there, in the back, another one. Don't be shy. If not, I'm happy to answer questions over a drink. Yes. <laughs> so, well, then, thank you again, Uriel. Thank, thank you, you. Mazi and Ipsa for the invitation. Thank you. And have a great weekend. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>